So, uh, just to give you a little bit of background con uh, concerning me, so I uh, obviously my, my French accent is uh, <laughs> a good indication where I'm coming from. Uh, I did a master degree back in France in 1999. Wow, that's a, that was a long time ago. I worked for 10 years in a, in, in eastern part of France in a research in a research center working on fruits production, so mostly plums cherries, uh, apricot, apple, um, looking, you know, mostly working on disease uh, management, disease control, as well as pest control. And then in 20, 2010, my wife got the wonderful idea of telling me, well, I may want to do a postdoc in the US. Uh, <laughs> why? I'm not speaking English. And I was, great, that's a great idea. And uh, we, uh, she, she went, she was accepted at the NIHS at this time, uh, which is part of the NIH. Uh, she's an immunologist, uh, way smarter than me. <laughs> um, basically, yeah, we, uh, we, uh, we arrived in the United States in 2010. Uh, we were in North Carolina, went back to school. I did my PhD at North Carolina State University, and I completely switched gears. I mean, I was focusing on insect, on uh, disease management in France. I decided that I would be interested in weed management, just to get the, the full spectrum. <laughs> So that's what I did. I got my PhD at NC State in 2015. I was working on weed management in sorghum. On, um, I postdoc for six months at NC State, and then I, I got my position at Rutgers. Uh, so I'm located, as Meredith said, at the Marucci Center. I'm mostly focusing on uh, uh, blueberry and cranberry production. Um, that's my two major crops. I'm working also on veggies, and I'm doing a little bit of work on grape sweet corn on fruits production as well. Everything is considered as specialty crops. Okay. Um, so that's what mostly what I'm doing, you know, looking at uh, uh, herbicide, herbicide control, because we still have, especially for uh, professional farmers, we are still using herbicides, obviously. I'm also looking at cover crop, and today I will uh, provide you some information that we got from our cover crop experimentation at Snyder's. Um, so that's, that will be uh, something that I will present today. So. Let's start right now. Uh, I mean, I, I was thinking that before you know, discussing weeds, we need to clearly define what is a weed. You know? So let's start with the definition of what is a weed. Um, this is a picture that I took back in North Carolina. Anyone can recognize this crop? No, not sweet potato. This one is cotton. Actually, that's cotton from uh, North Carolina. And you see, you see the cotton rose right here. And you see a lot of morning glories. You have a lot of morning glories growing between the rows right here. So that's that typical uh, situation that you have in a, in a uh, professional field. Uh, can you see the crop on this one? Yeah. I mean, you can see it right here. You can see the wheat spikes, the seed heads right here. But the field is basically overwhelmed by a weed. So the, this one with, you know, the big inflorescence, which is a little bit decumbent, uh, this one is Italian ryegrass. So that's a wheat field that have been completely uh, overwhelmed by Italian ryegrass. Oh, my God, that's my favorite weed. Actually, that's uh, one of the most, uh, I mean, I'm working a lot on this weed in, in cranberry. So right here, you can see the cranberry uh, right here. And you have these native plants that we have in cranberry bed in New Jersey that's called Carolina Redwood. And it's, it's a beautiful plant. Actually, when this one is blooming right here, uh, it's very attractive for pollinators. And actually, you know, cranberry growers consider this plant as a weed because when you see that, uh, it's overwhelming, basically, the, the cranberry. But it's really interesting. I, I would be interested to, to see if we can develop this plant as an ornamental plant uh, also, because it's really attracting for pollinators. Um, redwood, I mean, you can see why we gave uh, this name to this plant. So that's a rhizome. That's not exactly a root. That's a rhizome. We'll dis be discussing that later. But uh, this is a fleshy rhizome. And one of the most problematic, one of the biggest problems that we have with this plant in, in cranberry is that uh, in winter, when we are flooding, the cranberry bed, you know, for frost protection, we have tons of swans and geese that like to, to, to sit on the bed because it's just water. And they truthfully, they love to feed on that. 
And when they are digging up for finding the roots, for finding the redwood, at the same time, they will be digging up the, the cranberry. So the damage is not really through competition. It's mostly because this weed is attracting a bunch of wild animals that will be feeding on this plant, OK? Um, some other weeds I'm dealing with, too, this one right here. Uh, that's a blueberry, so that's some um, uh, bindweed right here. This one, uh, it's funny because it's actually, you can see the plastic. So usually in vegetable production, we are using plastic for preventing the weeds to grow, okay? But what you see right here are a bunch of, uh, a bunch of weeds that are growing to the plastic. That's yellow nut sedge, okay? And we'll be discussing that a little bit later. On, on this one right here, uh, it's a redwood pigweed. Uh, big seed producer on uh, uh, major weeds in, uh, in, uh, in vegetable production. So different situation. Um, I'm less exposed to this kind of crop, but in nurseries, uh, you, can have, you can deal with a lot of weed species as well. Um, even in, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, Christmas trees production area, you, I mean, they still have to deal with weed because, I mean, weed will be competing with the trees and the trees will be uh, not growing as well. And the last one is most... I mean, it's mostly what you're dealing with. It's really, uh, you know, ornamental beds uh, where, I mean, we have weed species that can be similar to the weed species that we're dealing with in, uh, in commercial, uh, in, in, uh, in agriculture, basically. So what is a weed? Uh, the weed, so weed Society of America has an official definition. It's considered as any plant that is objectionable or interferes with activities or welfare of man. And this is a definition that will encompass a lot of situation. So you can have a situation like this one where you have a cornfield and you see the morning glories. They are using the, uh, you know, the, the big uh, corn stalk to grow, uh, as a support on, on, on for growing. And you can have a situation like this one where you have a cotton field and right here you see a corn plant. And actually the story for this one is we are calling that volunteer corn. It's just that the previous year the grower was growing corn. Okay. And you may have seeds getting back to the ground, getting to the soil bank. On the next year, you will have these uh, uh, corn uh, seedlings emerging, and they will grow up to, to, to reach this size. And if you just have one, it's not such a big deal. But if you have many corn plants growing, in a, growing in, a, in a cotton field like this one, it may start to be a problem because the, co the corn will be competing with the cotton. So, the, the notion is not always, you no, know, weed is not just a wild species. It may be, in this case, it may be a domesticated species that is growing in a context where you don't want to get this species. So uh, if we're looking at more simplistic definition, a plant out of place, and in what we have seen before, the corn will be considered as out of place because you're not growing a cotton field for getting, for harvesting corn, basically. Um, a plant growing where it's not wanted, so it's usually, I mean, people tend to consider weeds are, uh, as any undesirable plant, a nuisance, hazard, a uh, plant that can be causing injuries, uh, uh, plants that are competing for nutrient lice and water. On uh, one of the problems with the weeds as well is that some weed species may be perfect host for disease on insects. Okay, so we'll be discussing that a little bit later. So. Uh, what are the basic characteristics of, uh, of weedy plants? So weedy plants generally they are very able to colonize disturbed environment and they can establish a population very rapidly. Uh, they have a very high reproductive capacity uh, and sometimes some weed species have multiple methods of reproduction. It's not just the production of seeds, it can be the production of stolons, it can be the production of rhizome, it can be the production of tubers, I mean not just one method of reproduction. Uh, when I say high reproductive capacity, uh, when I was mentioning the pigweed before, we have some species of pigweed, uh, one which is name is Palmer amaranth, and we're starting to get it in New Jersey, it's coming from the south. I have a friend of mine when where I was working at NC State, he counted the number of seeds per plant. One, one of the plants for which he was counting the seed, he managed to get up to 1.6 million seeds for one plant. 1.6 million, that's crazy. <laughs> Uh, so usually they have short time to reproduction, so between the emergence and the reproduction, the period is relatively short. Um, they will germinate and reproduce over a range of, of you know, of various environmental conditions. Um, 
they usually have seed dormancy. The, the germination can be adapted to the condition, to the weather condition. So they can just emerge when the weather condition, when the environmental condition are really good for the growth of this plant. Uh, some, the seed longevity can be very important for some species. Um, nut sedge, I remember looking at a study one day where nut sedge, when where they were looking at the nuts, the tubers of nut sedge, uh, up to 20 years later, you still have good emergence with these nuts. So you can, they can stick to the ground for 20 years, and 20 years later, they will still be able to germinate. Meaning that when you have a population of nut sedge in your garden, it will take a lot of time before starting to exhaust this population of tubers that you have in the soil. Uh, presence of vegetative reproductive structure, so that's what I was mentioning with the multiple methods that can be stolon, that can be rhizome. Um, uh, adaptation for spread through the, the dispersion of propagules. And um, basically, one of the big, the most uh, important characteristics uh, for me is that these plants usually are very well adapted for outcompeting the crops, uh, for competing for nutrients, for light, for water. And there is even studies these days that are mentioning that wheat can compete for gas. So you know they can <laughs> they can absorb more uh, gas than some crops, and maybe more efficient for, um, for for producing biomass. So why weeds always win? And I said always because I mean my job is you know it's it's a pretty new job because I will always be weed <laughs> around. <laughs> So uh, they really can adapt and change and get better over time. Um, they don't complain <laughs> how unfair life is. <laughs> uh, over time, they have encountered everything nature and humans could offer and evolve. And it's true, that's part of the evolution of weeds. I mean, why are they weeds? Because they can really, over time, I mean, the, the evolution process is making them more competitive. And that's really evolution that we observed right here. Uh, and basically, and we'll discuss that with herbicide resistance, but that's true that untold zillions have died for the cause. And a few of them survived, but the ones that survived are the best ones. And um, yeah, the survivors are the winners, basically. So uh, why do we care about weed control? Uh, I mean, it's a little bit outdated but uh, 30 years ago, but I guess it's still valid these days. Um, in the US, I mean, 12% of crop production that, that was lost to the weeds. And it's even the number one major source of uh, crop losses. It's even before disease. It's even before uh, uh, insects. It's mostly because when you have weeds, if you really have a lot of weed population, uh, a lot of weed plants, this one can outcompete the crop. So even before starting to produce the crop, uh, the crop will be in a, in a you know, will, will not do well because it's outcompeted by the weeds. Okay. You know, I'm starting to get uh, uh, inquiries about, well, what was, what was uh, this year looking like for, for weed control? And I'm, wow, that's the worst year that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, you know, I've been working in weed for the last uh, eight years, and actually, it's, I've never seen that. I mean, it was perfect condition for weed growth this year. I mean, we have a succession of, you know, uh, wet period followed by uh, high temperature, which is really good for all these weeds to develop in, in, a, in, in this kind of condition. So that's, that's, that, was a, that was good for me. I had a very nice experimentation in the field, but well. So the weed can cause different type of loss. Uh, we can have direct losses. So uh, that's mostly what we are thinking when we are uh, thinking of weeds. The weeds can reduce the crop yield to competition. Uh, the weed can reduce the crop yield to allelopathy. And if you're not familiar with allelopathy, uh, it's basically that some plant have the ability to produce natural herbicide. Okay, so the plant will be producing and exuding in the soil some natural product that will have a detrimental effect on any other species. Not directly to the species which is producing the product, but to any other species. Um, think of sorghum, because I've been working on sorghum, so I, I know this one. But think of sorghum on, on Johnson grass, which is a, a major problem in pastures. If you see big clump of Johnson grass without any other species in the clump, it's mostly because the Johnson grass is producing the sorgoleon compound, the natural product. And the sorgoleon is a natural herbicide. Okay, so plant can produce some plant species, not all species, but some plant species may produce some natural herbicides. And we'll be discussing that in the cover crop. When I will be discussing cover crop later, that will be a, a, a big, really interesting topic to look to. 
Uh, weed can reduce harvesting efficiency because if you have many weeds, a grower you know, will have to work slower because he will have to, do, to spend more time cleaning up uh, what he's collecting, what he's harvesting. On the weed, it can reduce uh, the quality of the crop. Uh, think if, if you had some weeds like um, uh, nightshade, for example, uh, you, are, you have these beautiful uh, blackberries on the nightshade. Um, you don't want to get that in a crop because berries, the blackberries of nightshade are notoriously uh, toxic. So you want to make sure that you're cleaning, you know, that you're not getting this kind of, uh, of berries in the crop because it would be full of toxin uh, when you're collecting, when you're selling your crop. Indirect uh, losses uh, basically will spend some time, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to control, manage the weeds, so that will increase the production cups, the production cost. Sorry, uh, we can have some crop injury when professionals are using either uh, mechanical control or herbicide control. I mean, an herbicide. Even if the crop is supposedly tolerant, you can still have a lot of injury depending on the condition when you apply the herbicide. So that you may have some damage to the crop. And based on the weed population, the growers may be limited in his, you know, in, in the choice that he can make when he's growing a crop. If he has a weed which is really a problem in, in, uh, in corn, for example, he may not just want to use corn because he knows that he will not be able to control this specific species. Okay. Uh, some other reason why weed control matters. Uh, this one is horse nettle. On this one, it's uh, solanaceous weed. It's basically the same family as tomato. So it's hosting the tomato, the tomato mosaic virus. Uh, as it's, it's an host for this virus because it's the same botanical family. Uh, if you have a lot of weed density on the ground, that will be a perfect cover for rodents. And they will like it because it's, prote it's offering protection uh, to them. On the right here, it's mostly something that we have problem in, in blueberry. We have this blueberry maggot, uh, which is laying eggs on the fruit, and you will have as a blueberry, and there will be a nice source of proteins uh, within the fruit. Okay, so you have wide species like huckleberry that can be host for these uh, for these insects, and you want to make sure that you don't have too many because otherwise, I mean, it will be a, a good source of infestation for 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 this uh, for this pest. Some other reason, um, so uh, uh, weeds can be held hazard to humans and livestock. So think of common ragweed. Uh, it's really an, a very allergic plant. If, I mean, the pollen, I'm not very sensitive to this one, but I know that in my family, I have people, I mean, they cannot stand next to a common ragweed because if there is pollen that is produced, I mean, they will get, I mean, <laughs> they will be in bad shape. Think of poison ivy. Um, uh, think of poison hemlock, uh, eastern black nightshade that I was mentioning. And I mean, the picture is not really clear, but you can see the blackberries that I was mentioning. On the big leaves that I'm holding right here, it's pumpkin. So when you have a grower uh, who is uh, growing a pumpkin field, and he will have kids coming to the pumpkin field to collect pumpkins at this time of the year, if the kids are starting to find these uh, black berries from nightshade, what do you think will happen? I mean, kids are really tempted to eat this one. And I mean, that's not something that we want to, to in an institution that we want to, to end up with. A mile a minute, which is an invasive weed, it's a kind of, yeah, it's really, it's even worse than anything. A mile a minute is uh, producing some toxic fruit as well. But weeds can be useful too. I mean, weeds are not always bad. Uh, so you can use weed for st uh, stabilizing the soil and, and preventing erosion. Uh, weeds will provide habitat for natural enemies of pests. On, uh, back in Europe, I mean, we are working, when I was working on insect control, I mean, we are trying to lay down on the side, of, when I was working in orchards production, in fruits production, we are trying to implement some uh, weed strip uh, in the orchards for hosting natural predators of aphids. Okay? Does it make sense? Because this plant will host uh, natural predators. I mean, at some point, the predators can move to the orchard, to the tr tree fruit, and on, on start feeding on, on, the, on, on aphids. Um, weeds can provide wildlife habitat, and they can be a potential crops. So think of purslane. Purslane, it's, it's, I've been, I have tons of growers telling me that purslane, ah, it's bad. I mean, we cannot deal with this one. But actually, we can, you can make really good salad with purslane. Uh, Anyone knows what is this crop? 
that's co that's nut sedge. That's actually yellow nut sedge right here. On here, that's what we're calling tiger nuts. Okay. So at ti tiger nuts, tiger nuts. On at Rutgers, we have one of our faculty member, Dr. Albert Ayeni, is uh, the specialty crop uh, specialist. And he's growing tiger nuts, so yellow nut sedge, because the nuts, the tubers of yellow nut sedge, of this variety of yellow nut sedge, are full of uh, good product for your health. That's what basically Albert uh, is teaching us. So I mean, it's really making, apparently, it's, there is a market for buying the tubers, there is a market for making flour, flowers from, from the tubers. So that's really, Albert is telling us that there is a market for this one, okay? It's not the wild nut sedge that you will be finding in your garden. Actually, this one, the one that we are growing uh, experimentally uh, with Rutgers, it's a variety that Albert got in Nigeria, okay? Um, so it's nut sedge, yellow nut sedge, it's, it has a wor worldwide repartition. So you can find it in Europe, you can find it in Africa, you can find it pretty much on every continent on Earth. But this variety specifically is coming from Nigeria and it's produ producing bigger tubers, bigger nuts than the wild varieties that we have in, in, uh, in New Jersey. So uh, that's, that's the market for this one. Yes? So one of the questions <laughs> is can we get intercrossing between the wild population and the cultivated population? Um, some things that I know is that nut sedge is not reproducing through the production of seeds. So you may have this big uh, flower stem, you, I mean, they will be producing seeds, but the seeds are unfertile. They're not fertile. So it's the most, I mean, the reproduction of nut sedge, it's multiplication to rhizome production and mostly through the production of tubers. And what you see when you have a nut sedge population is that if you're starting to look at, in May, uh, when you're starting to see the first seedlings coming to the surface of the ground, all of the seedlings are linked to a nuts to a tuber. So it's not through the production of seed, it's really through the production of tubers. And I will show you later a slide where we are discussing the way the tubers are formed uh, in yellow nut sedge. So what can we do for controlling the weeds? Yeah, exactly. The first one is what I can spray on this uh, weed to kill it and how much do I need? That's in, ex in the extension world that the first question that we are getting. And actually, that's not the way we need to address weed management in the first place. The first thing we need to do when we are dealing with weed is to put a name on the plant that we are dealing with. Okay? So the first step of any integrated weed management strategy is to properly identify the weeds. Um, and there will be, I mean, when we'll be discussing weed ID, I will give you reason why we need to correctly identify the weeds. So where do we start? Um, so I, I said, yeah, it's the most important part of any weed control program, because if you're able to identify the weed, you will determine which type of weed control is needed. Uh, no cultural, mechanical, or herbicide strategy can control all weed species. And if you are able to identify specifically the species, that can give you clues about other cultural problems that you may have uh, in, in, you know, in your field, in your garden. So if you have wet areas, this one will be perfect for stimulating the development of yellow nut sedge or rushes. If you have dry areas, that's usually an indication, uh, well, where you have spurge growing, it's usually a good indication that you have a dry area, so that maybe you're lacking moisture in this part of your garden. And uh, one that I don't think, I didn't see it so far in, uh, in New Jersey, but further north you can find it, on, in Europe it's all over the place, stinging nettle. Uh, the stinging nettle usually is growing in excessive nitrogen area. And, and back in Europe, if you have, you know, if you have a, a pastures where people are keeping sheep, yeah, sheep, <laughs> it's a question of pronunciation, uh, usually you will see the stinging nettle growing in the area where people are, you know, when they're keeping the sheep before sending back to the barn for the night, when they're spending a lot of time, so there is a lot of things getting back to the ground, that's where you will start to see the stinging nettle growing. So that's good indication. Weeds, you can always consider, you can almost consider weeds as bio-indicator for problems that you may have uh, in the garden or in the field. So uh, let's discuss about what, you, what are your weed identification resources. So the best book that I know so far is Weeds of the Northeast. That's, that's this book. I bring my version of it. Um, 
Um, so it, you can find it if you still want to get it. You can find it on, on the Cornell uh, website. On I put on the handout, I put the indication on, on, you know, I put the title. On you're just typing the title on Google, on, on you will find the indication where you can buy it. So it's a little bit outdated, I would say. I mean, we have some new spaces, some new weed spaces that would be. I mean, it would be good to integrate them into the guide. I think it would be great at some point. Maybe one day I can have time to do that, to update yeah. a guide. <laughs> oh my god, it's sabbatical. It's maybe a good idea for a grant. <laughs> uh, one that you cannot, or, I don't want to discard this one, but the Peterson Field Guides collection, you have the Wildflower Guide, and you may have some spaces you know, that may not be in the weed guide, because the weed guide is mostly for uh, you know, vegetable, for professional production. So you may not, I mean, someone was asking me about bone set. Um, yeah, that's something that you can find in this one that you will not find in the weeds of the Northeast, basically. If you're looking to the Rogers website, uh, I'm working with Lina Struve. She's, a, she's a, a taxonomist, a botanical taxonomist at, at Rogers University. And a few years ago, Lina and, and colleagues put this kind of field guide where you have the let's say the, the 20 or 30 most important species of weed that you can find uh, you know in in new brunswick you know, on campus on um, they're still good they're still good guides so on this one you have a version for grasses where you can find the buckwheat plantain you can uh, um, find horsetail you can find a uh, wild garlic right here and you have different weed species that are really uh, common on campus so i mean that's always something good to have if you're in the field. Uh, it's available. I mean, I put the link right here for, for getting uh, it's it's free online, so you can access to this one. You have the same version for die cuts for broadleaf species. So you will get the dandelion. You will have the common yarrow. So I mean, it, at least it's providing you a kind of nice picture of what are the most common weed that you know uh, that are around on, on campus on, on in New Jersey as well. So. Uh, there is a second part where you can have right here. You can I can see common purslane, uh, violet. That a few people uh, bring violet today. So violet is on the list of weeds definitely. Uh, we have endbit right here, and I will be discussing endbit a little bit later. So the last uh, resources, the last one that I wanted to mention is that uh, universities on the northeast have always good website with weed identification. They may not be always the easiest one to find what species you're dealing with, but you may want to spend some time looking at this website. So you have Virginia Tech. There's two websites on Virginia Tech. Penn State has a good website. Rutgers has a website that, if I have time, I would love to update it. <laughs> uh, Ohio State has a good one for perennial and biennial weeds, and we'll be discussing the difference between perennial and biennials. Uh, University of Delaware, they scan and put online uh, an old guide, but still good for grass and broadleaf identification. So you have a PDF online available on, at, the, you know, at this website. Uh, University of Missouri has good resources as well. On WSSC, the Weed Society of America, if you're going on the WSSC website, you will find information on weed ID as well as some information on alternative method of weed control. You may find information on herbicide. Too. Um, actually, it's interesting because you can see the good side of using herbicide, but you can also see the downsides of using herbicide, and we'll be discussing that as well today. So that's really good, good, good source of information. On um, you know these websites, the WSSA website, uh, all people who are collaborating of, uh, to the website are university professor, on um, not uh, you know company company people. So I mean, that's kind of information that I, I think you can really trust the kind of information you can get on these websites. Uh, last one that I managed to find yesterday. Uh, Meredith, do you know the extension website? Yeah, e extension. Yeah, e so the, on this one, I found a very really nice paper describing all the weed ID methodology. Okay. That's basically describing all the steps that you have to go through if you want to identify, to positively identify a weed species. So I really recommend to, to use this one. Everyone got a picture of the slide? <laughs> so uh, let's look at wha what are some clues for identifying weeds. So the first one is identification by morphology. And the way we are separating weeds is either die cuts, the broadleaf species, 
This one have seedlings that have two cotyledons. And if you're looking at the venation of the leaves, it's like if it was a, a net of, you know, of, of diverging uh, veins. The grasses are monocots. So this one, the seedlings only bear one cotyledons. The leaf venation are always parallel. They are not diverting in all direction. And usually, if you're looking at, um, uh, uh, at the leaves, I mean, you can see the sheathing uh, on the stem. Basically, the, the base of the leaf is surrounding the stem. And that's the way uh, we are identifying grasses. Okay. Uh, I put grasses into parentheses because, I mean, in, in the monocot family, there's grasses, but you can find sedges, you can find rushes that are sedges, rushes are not grasses. Okay, there are different families. They are not uh, from the Poaceae family. And there is other way to identify them. Uh, we can identify weeds by life cycle. So we have annual weeds. This one will complete the life cycle in one growing season. So we can separate again depending on the time of the year. So we can have the summer annuals. This one will germinate and produce uh, uh, vegetation in, in spring and summer. They will produce seed and they will die in fall. Okay. On the winter annuals, this one will germinate in fall. Um, they will keep growing during the winter. They will produce seed in mid-spring and by early summer they will die. So just to give you some ideas of what we are talking, summer annual we broadleaf weeds, lamb squatter, Gallin soga, a major weeds in, in, vege in, uh, in vegeta um, uh, for vegetable production. Morning glories, all these three species are summer annual uh, broadleaf weeds. Uh, Nbit, this one, it's really a winter annual. So Nbit start to germinate in September, October. On in February, March, you will see this beautiful pink coloration in the field. It's mostly Nbit. So we have some grasses as well. So can do the same differentiation between summer and winter annual with the grasses. So crabgrass, goosegrass, barnyard grass, three species that are considered as summer annuals. Winter annual, ryegrass. Uh, you have seen the picture of ryegrass growing in wheat. Wheat is a winter crop, so uh, definitely ryegrass is a, it's a winter annual. Annual bluegrass that you will see in the garden is really a winter annual. You will not find annual bluegrass in, uh, in, in June or, or, or July. Uh, we have the biennial weed, so this one will uh, need two growing seasons to complete the life cycle. So the very first year they will produce a rosette, okay? They will accumulate a lot of nutrients. On the very next year from the rosette, you will have the production of a, of a stem and the plant will start to bloom. So it's definitely on two, uh, two years that you, you will get production for this plant. So one uh, that I really like because it's making this kind of huge candles, uh, the common mullein, so you have the rosette stage during the first year, so the plant is really accumulating a lot of nutrients. On the next year from the rosette, you will have this production of this big stem and these beautiful flowers. Uh, toxic plant, by the way, too. On the last one, the most problematic ones are the perennial weeds, so this one can live for a long period of time. Uh, they can produce vegetative structures, uh, uh, so that allows them to live for more than two years without having to reproduce some seed, and we'll make a distinction between the simple perennials and the creeping perennials. So simple perennials, think of dandelion or plantain. So this one have a big uh, vegetative structure, so usually they have a big taproot, which is stirring a lot of elements. So you in may, at some point of the year, you may not see the plant at the surface of the ground, but the taproot is still in the ground. On the next, I mean, you can have a new plant emerging from this one. Uh, the simple perennial, the, the reproduction is only by seeds. You don't have rhizome or solar production. Um, when we are discussing the creeping perennials, this one, uh, this one can overwinter and produce new plants from vegetative reproductive structures, and they can also reproduce from seeds. So one that I really like, it's a good model, it's Canada thistle. Okay, this one is really a creeping perennial because. Not only you have the production of seeds through the production of flowers right here, but you have this big rhizome undergrown, and the rhizome can produce new plants coming at the surface. Okay, uh, same a grass would be Johnson grass that I was mentioning earlier. This one would be a creeping perennial because you have a rhizome in the soil, and you can produce seeds as well. So yeah, we have it. Someone brings some Canada thistle right here. So that's, that's the way I like to, to, to look at it. 
But yeah, that's kind of the teaser right here. So you can see the seeds, so reproduction by seeds. You can see the flower right here. Um, very impressive. I mean, yeah, you can see in four the production. But look at this one. So that was an experimentation in Ohio, if I remember. I got a picture from Ohio State University. But that just one plant on two years after seeding, one plant is the kind of rhizome that you're getting. It's not just roots, it's really a rhizome, meaning that on the rhizome, you can have new plants coming from the rhizome on, you know. Uh, so it's, it's really, it's impressive because it's getting deep and it's getting wide. I mean, it's, it's really keeping, occupying a lot of space. And if you're looking at canna teasel, the seeds can germinate 10 days after reaching maturity. So you, I mean, it's, you know, it's producing seed and the seed are dropping and you can already have plants germinating relatively soon. The seed can lay dormant in soil for up to 20 years. On the seed, when we are releasing the dormancy, the seed can remain viable for up to six years. That's a long period of time. Yes? How deep is that? Right here, uh, it's can, I, I've seen up to six, seven, eight feet deep. Yeah. In the wild, would it go to six or eight feet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that situation may be not so good. Is that if you're cutting, if you're shopping part of the rhizome, every individual part of the rhizome, as long as you have a node on it, can produce a new plant. So one stuff that people are, you know, in, in organic farming, something that we don't recommend to growers to do is tilling. Because if you're tilling, you will cut this rhizome in multiple spaces, you know, multiple individual parts, and you will spread the weed even more. Okay, and you, you will drag, when you're tilling, you're dragging, uh, you know, your equipment, and you can, you can really spread this plant, this plant far away. So, unfortunately, the best options that we still have these days for controlling this one are herbicides. And, and I mean, it's, that's why it's such a, a big problem in organic system, is that we don't have really good ways for controlling this plant. Maybe shading, maybe using some uh, some cover on the soil to, to you know to kill the seedlings when they are emerging because they are deprived of, of light. That may be a solution. But when you think that the seed can lay dormant in the soil for up to 20 years, I mean that that's long-term management <laughs> right here. Another one that I really like, <laughs> yellow nut sage. So when I was talking about nut sage, so nut sage it's a it's a monocot, okay? It's what I was calling a grass, except it's not really a grass because it has some uh, morphological difference with grasses. Uh, so you have the true roots, and you can see the fine, airy roots right here, where the plant is absorbing the nutrients. You can see the big one right here that don't have any branching, which are the rhizomes, okay, right here. And you can see right here the nuts. So, this plant, I collected it in uh, probably in November, December. And what's going on is that at the tip of the rhizome, when the days are starting to, uh, when the length of the day is starting to get, uh, you know, uh, shorter, uh, what will happen is that there is some uh, physiological processes in the plant that will trigger the production of nuts. So the nuts are produced at the tip of the rhizome. So let's say that the plant is emerging in May, May, June, July, August. Well, up to July, the plant will mostly colonize by producing rhizome. So you have rhizome, the plant is producing new plants, blah, blah, blah. And at some point in August, I mean, the plant will turn off the production of new plants and will concentrate the energy in producing a tubers and nuts at the tip of the rhizome. So you have these two ways of propagation. The rhizome during one part of the year, and later in the season, the plant will start producing tubers because that will that's what will give uh, birth to a new generation the very next year, okay? Because uh, uh, with the first frost, the rhizome will be killed, but all the energy that the plant collected will be concentrated in the tubers, okay, in the nuts. Why do we not, why I don't like uh, yellow nut sedge? Uh, so you have uh, a strawberry plantation, you have the plastic, on four days after, a you know, laying down the plastic, you already have a little <laughs> seedlings <laughs> of, of nut sedge emerging to the plastic. Okay, so really, really problematic plant to control in, in, um, in vegetable production. And yeah, before long, I mean, you can have this kind of invasion. And actually, in, uh, in blueberries, that's something that uh, 
uh, that you are facing some situation where, yeah, I mean, we, we have this kind of environment where you have a lot of uh, nuts edge biomass on professional growers who are using herbicide. I, I'm telling them, if you have this kind of biomass, don't even bother to use herbicide. Because your herbicide, some of the herbicide need to work into the ground, they need to get into the ground. If you have this kind of biomass standing at the surface of the ground, the herbicide cannot even go to the ground. So basically, it will be useless. Same thing for our gardens. Yeah, same thing for home garden. Um, I mean, that's, we can discuss that when I will be discussing herbicide later, but there is some recommendation, basic recommendation before using herbicide in, uh, you know, at home or in, in professional situation. Uh, identifying grasses, it's always tricky. Um, don't get me right, but I always prefer to identify the broadleaf species because the grasses, it's, it's not my favorite plants. <laughs> so usually some of the typical features of grasses, um, you really have right here what we're calling the sheath. So that's basically uh, the, the base of the leaves uh, surrounding the stem. You have what we're calling right here the auricle. You have the ligule, which is a kind of membrane that you can see on, uh, at the base of the leaf. Uh, you have the stem, you have the blade, which is the surface of the leaf, basically. Um, so, yeah. So what, what is that? Oracle, exactly. What is that? Legule. Um, when you're looking at grasses, that's the two most important component features of the plant that you need to look for for identification. So ligule can have different shape. It can be membranous. It can be just a fringe of earth like this one. It can be truncated. Some species, you don't have a ligule at all. Uh, it can be rounded. It can be tapered. It can be toothed. Um, if you're looking at auricle, it can be cloud-like. Cloud Well-developed on this one. It can be rounded. It can be not fully developed. So you just have some kind of bump on, on the shears. Uh, on, on this one, it's, it's uh, totally absent. So right here, just a picture uh, that, um, that's uh, annual ryegrass. On this one, has really a well-developed auricle. So you can see it right, right here. And you can see the membranous legal at the base of the plant. So you really need to get a lens if you want to get into uh, grass identification. You, in, you, you better get to get a you know a magnifying lens to see these kind of features because it can be tricky between species. So leaf sheath, it's uh, it can be completely split, it can be overlapping, or it can be fused in some species. Um, some other features that we need to look to are the the, um, the panicle, uh, the seed head. Um, we can look at the presence of earth. On this one, it's a foxtail. It's a John foxtail. I mean, it's really easy to identify because it's, it's uh, you have this typical conical uh, seed seed heads. And if you're looking at the leaves, I, I know it's not really great on the picture, but you can see tiny trichomes. That's the way uh, we are calling that. It's a lot of small earth on the blade of the uh, on the blade of the plant, and it's a good way for identifying it as well. This one is a crabgrass. On one way you can identify at least large crabgrass is through the presence of earth on the stem. So you can see the earth right here. Okay. There is a second species, smooth crabgrass. Smooth crabgrass doesn't have any earth on, on it. So you have to find other way to identify it. So uh, the grass seed head, you can have the open panicle and you can have spikes. It can be compact like in, in foxtail or it can be divided. Uh, like in uh, crabgrass or goosegrass. Some species, annual brewgrass, winter annual, something which is really nice with this one is that if you're looking at the shape of the leaf, uh, the leaf tip will have this kind of typical boat shape. Okay. Um, I mentioned to you that it was a winter annual. Uh, Bermuda grass, uh, that's a kind of spreading perennial. So you have a production, not a rhizome this time, but that's what we are calling a stolon. So the rhizome, it's an underground structures for propagating the plant. The stolon, it's above the ground, okay? Strawberry, strawberry are a perfect example of plants that are propagating through stolon. So you have these huge stems coming from the mother plant that will start producing some, some, some other plants. So that's the way Bermuda grass is propagating. Um, so usually on the leaves, you will have a very uh, presence of earth. On something that I really like with this one is that Right here, the junction between the leaf and the stem, 
you have this uh, little tuff of earth which is uh, really tall and it's a way for, for, for uh, identifying it with the fact that it's, it's growing on a stolon as well. Okay. Smooth crabgrass, uh, this one, it's a summer annual. Uh, it's really, it can grow prostrate on the ground, so it's not, you know, making a big, um, a big shank. It's just propagating to uh, uh, flatly on the ground. Um, the leaf blades on both surfaces are usually glabrous, meaning that they, they don't have any earth. Uh, on the ligule, it's membranous with even margin. Okay, that's some characteristic. But if you have the book, or if you're looking to the website, you will have good illustration on the books on the website. You will have good illustration of what, what you need to look for. Goosegrass, um, something that I really like with goosegrass, which is make it very easy to identify, is that when you're looking to goosegrass, you really have this white coloration uh, at the center of the plant. That's really a key uh, features of, of goosegrass. Barnyard grass, uh, this one, it's, it's really nice because it's a plant where you don't have ligule and you don't have auricle. So when you're looking right here, you don't see any ligule, you don't see any auricle. And if you're looking at the seed head, it's, it's really a typical seed head, like if it was a, a, sorrel, a sorrel plant, basically, like if it was not weed, but barley or something like that. So really relatively easy to identify. Uh, Italian ryegrass, so this one has the very typical big elongated auricle. So uh, Italian ryegrass, it's a winter annual, so don't look for it in July or August, uh, look for it in March, April. Uh, but um, the, the clue is really looking at the auricle on this one to identify it. Identifying broadleaf weeds. So, really, I mean, you, you have that in, I, I give that in your handout. So, I mean, that's the kind of vocabulary that you need to know when you're looking to a website or a book. You need to, fa to be familiar with that. So, I, I gave that to you on the, on the handout. Um, that's kind of information that you need to, to, to know. But basically, we're looking at the arrangement of the leaves on, on the stem, so it can be opposite. So you have two leaves opposite to each other, like in Porto. It can be alternate, uh, like on arrow leaf cider, or it can be a wall, like on carpet weed. The leaf structure, they can be uh, simple or sessile, meaning that they don't have any petiole. Uh, it can be bitternate, they can be palmately compound, like in giant ragweed. So you have one leaf subdivided in uh, not subdivided, but you have this kind of division. It's still the same leaf, but you have some uh, division on the leaves. Or it can be pinately compound, uh, meaning that you just have one leaf, but you can see some leaflets uh, coming from the main vein. Uh, on this one, it's sickle pod. Uh, you have different leaf shape, cordate, lanceolate, lyrate, uh, cordate, so it's air shaped like in tall morning glory. Lanceolate, it's lens shaped like in Eclipta. Uh, sagittate, like a, uh, an arrow, uh, on common arrow head. You can have reniform, kidney shaped like on ground ivy. You can uh, have ovate, uh, egg shaped leaves like in Palmer amaranth or any, uh, any pigweed species. Oblanceolate, linear, so this one are very long elongated leaves. This one, rancinate, that's the uh, scientific word for describing the leaves of dandelion. So it's very lacerated, if you want. So some typical weed species, we have carpet weed. So carpet weed, it's a summer annual, so at this time of the year, you will not see, see it anymore. I guess the first rust just kill it. Uh, you really, I mean, the leaves, I mean, you really have the world arrangement uh, of the leaf. It's growing, it's growing prostrate on the soil, which is another way of identifying it. Um, the stem is glabrous and will branch in many directions. So you may have the mother plant right here and you have all this plant developing from, from a stolon, if you want, right here. Actually, it's not, let me get back to that. It's not a stolon because it's really a stem because on the stolon, you can have roots, you know, rooting from the stolon. On this one, the roots will just be concentrated on the mother plant. So everything which is Away from the main plant, it's on a stem, but it's not a stolon because you don't have any uh, roots coming from, from this stem. Common chickweed, good time for, uh, for looking for chickweed. Um, so this one can root at the nodes. Um, it usually can be smooth or pubescent on older portion. Um, typical small plant, it's not really getting any big. 
you have these small uh, white flowers on it, um, relatively easy to identify. Uh, lip shape, I mean, uh, oval or elliptic with uh, the tip is acute, meaning that the tip of the leaf is terminating with a, a small peak. Common lump squatter, um, one good way of identifying common lump squatter, even at the seedling stage, is that you have this kind of whitish powdery uh, powder on the leaves. Okay, so you can write, see it right here. You have the white coloration on the leaf. On, even in older plants like this one, you can see it relatively easily. So that might, you know, even if I don't know all the vocabulary for identifying the plant, if I know one typical characteristic, I will be able to identify it. On the Latin name of, of this one is Scenopodium album. Album in Latin mean white. So you can make the, you know, I mean, you can make the, the correspondence between the Latin name and the correlation of the leaf with the white correlation right here. Oops. Okay, so um, the next one is uh, that I wanted to discuss is a uh, wood sorrel. Um, this is really, I mean, the leaf shape is typical. I mean, you have this kind of almost clover leaves, but with this really nice earth shape of each leaflet. You have the yellow, the small yellow flowers. Uh, not really a big deal uh, outside, but in containers, in nurseries, in greenhouse, this one is really a problem because on this one has a really nice of way of propagating is that if you're looking at the seed pod, the seed pod at some point can just exp oops losing everything. <laughs> the seed pod can just explode and project the seed away from the mother plant, meaning that it increases the ability for the plant to, to spread away. Yeah. Was able to do it. <laughs> so every bitter cress, uh, I've seen a lot these days in my garden. Um, this one, I mean, the leaf shape, it's making a rosette uh, right here. Um, you have the typical pinnate leaf, so you have one leaf subdivided in so many leaflets. Uh, if you're looking right here, the seed pod, the seed pod are characteristic as well, and you will have uh, the same kind of. Uh, propagation process and we have for yellow wood sorrel with the seed pod you know just bursting open on, on dispersing the seed away. Common cockle burr, um, easy to identify if you're looking at the stem you have all this uh, dark spot on the stem of, of common cockle burr. It's, uh, it's a really, I mean, it's getting a, more and more a problem in, in, a, in, a, in, some, in some crop, in soybean. I've seen a lot of cockleburr in New Jersey this year. Uh, some other way to identify cockleburr is that if you're taking the leaves, the leaves are like sandpaper. I mean, it's something that, yeah, I mean, it's really, uh, it's really harsh. On here, you can see the, the typical burr uh, when the plant is uh, at this time of the year. Horseweed, actually, that's nice because it's, this one, that's horseweed. Um, it's in the Aster family. It's a winter annual, so you have the basal rosette. On uh, the very next year, the plant will start producing this big stem. So you have the ones that, that I, I, I brewed this morning. Uh, so you have multiple, a very, very small flower. I don't think that this one, oh, yeah, the flowers just started to open on this one. So you will see that the flowers are very, very extremely small, but producing so many seeds on this one. Okay, buckhorn plantain, so there is two species of plantain. This one, uh, you can really see the parallel uh, venation on the leaves that's typical of, of plantain. It's a, it's a perennial plant. Um, the inflorescence is, uh, you have this kind of conical flower right here. And there is two species of plantain that are really common. We have the buckhorn plantain with the very elongated leaves. And we have the broadleaf plantain right here. And um, maybe one of the plants, I didn't check it carefully, but maybe one of the, uh, maybe bloodleaf plantain. On this one, you still have the kind of same parallel venation, but the leaves are way more rounded than the other species. Eastern black nightshade, um, think of, of a tomato. <laughs> uh, typical coloration, I mean, it's uh, black nightshade because you have this kind of black coloration on the underside of the leaves. Um, 
uh, making these uh, these uh, toxic uh, berries, and you really have. I mean, you know, it's in the Selenaceae family just by looking at the flowers on this one. Uh, Erigalin soga, um, something which is really. I mean, um, we have a lot of problem uh, controlling this one in commercial production. Uh, you really have the typical egg-shaped uh, triangular leaves right here. Um, you have the margin of the leaves. That's another feature that you need to look when you don't, when we want to identify species. You need to look at the margin. On this one, is coarsely toast. Uh, on the plant, is really covered with earth all over the place. I mean, you can look at the stem, you can look at the at the leaves. You will find earth uh, all over the plant. Uh, common grunsel. I've seen it. Someone brewed some common grunsel right here. So that's this one. Uh, common grunsel, it's in the same family, uh, it's an Aceraceae. Um, uh, it may look like a T-cell, except that you don't have any spine on this one. Uh, you have this kind of dark green coloration of the leaves. The leaves are very uh, transinate, uh, uh, like in, um, in, in dandelion. And if you're cutting them, they will start to produce some milk. So in, same thing as you know, the salad uh, family. Jimson weed, uh, one of my favorite weed. <laughs> I just like the flower of this one. Um, but I mean, re easily recognize. I mean, you can recognize it very easily at this time of the year because you have this uh, big fruit right here. Extremely toxic plant. Uh, I don't have any picture on this one of flowers, unfortunately. On yeah, on this one, if you're touching it, the plant will uh, the plant will emit an unpleasant odor uh, when when you're touching it, and it's it's highly toxic. So let's let's switch gears on, you know, I mean, I, I just wanted to give you some idea of some common species of weeds. On, I, I, I wanted also to discuss, you know, what are the different methods for controlling weeds in fruit and veggies. So when we are discussing managing the weeds, the first step right here is really identify and monitor your population, okay? So, I mean, when we are, I'm discussing to growers, it, I am telling them you do, just don't want to wait for getting the weeds. You may want to act preventively, you know, monitor your population, be in the field, scout for weeds, don't wait too late because it will be, the later you're, la you're waiting for controlling the weeds, the more difficult it will be for, for, for trying to get rid of them. So there's basically three different management strategies that can be chemical, herbicide, we can have cultural practices that can be controlling the weeds, and we can have biological practices as well. So what are the objectives of weed control? Um, these days we are discussing mostly, we are focusing mostly on prevention. So it's like a disease. Instead of treating the disease, you will do whatever you can to prevent the disease to come first place. Okay, so that's what we are dealing with prevention. We are trying to keep the weed out of the field uh, before having to deal with them. Eradication, it's something that in the 50s, 60s, they were discussing eradication because people were thinking that it was possible to completely control a weed and to eliminate it from a field. From what we know these days, no, because I mean, there is such a huge seed bank in the soil, weeds seed bank in the soil, that it will be really hard to eradicate some species. There is still some eradication process going on, uh, especially for invasive weeds. If you heard of uh, giant hogweed, which is a plant uh, from uh, uh, Caucasus, uh, Turkey, basically. This one you can consider to get an er eradication problem because there are so many health issues related to the presence of this plant that you don't want to have this plant anywhere uh, on, on, uh, in, in New Jersey. Uh, control versus management. Control, we assume that eradication is possible. Uh, on, we are I'm mostly focusing on management because in management it's based on understanding the relationship between weed population dynamics and damage caused by the weed. Meaning that when you're dealing with management, you're considering that you can accept to get some weeds. You can accept up to the point where the weeds are causing some damage to the crop. Okay? It's not because you have one plant you know, in a field that you have to eliminate it. You can have a threshold. I mean, you know, you may have five, six, 10 plants, they will not cause any damage. But when you're starting to get 20 plants, that's where you will start to get uh, crop reduction, you know, real yield reduction or damage to the plant. Yes? Well, I understand that. Well, there's another element to take into account. It's aesthetics. 
so many people want to eradicate because you know when you are getting weeds they may not be competing with the plants that you're planting in the garden but aesthetically speaking uh, that's not something that you want you may you have a picture of my i want to get my garden looking like that if i have weeds that's not what i want first place because it's not looking great so i mean you have the aesthetic so you may want to consider eradication by putting out the weeds when they're coming when they're emerging so but if I was in my own garden at home, I can tolerate, you know, when I have my tomatoes, I can tolerate some weeds. Because when the tomatoes are full grown, they're shedding the ground. Everything which is on the ground will stay very small. You may have some weeds. They may not look beautiful, but they will not really compete with my, with my garden plants. So that's, that's, that's the difference between, you know, in the garden, yeah, if you're producing veggies, you may tolerate some weed species. If you have... Uh, some plants that you're just planting for aesthetics, you may not want to tolerate weed because it's it's more linked to some artistic patterns that you may want to have in your garden with plants and you know colors and stuff like that. So you can talk about eradication, except that when we are discussing eradication with growers, it's eradication most of the time with chemical. In your garden, you cannot consider eradication with chemical with herbicide. It will be you spending a lot of time just putting out any weed that is emerging. So we have different types of weed control methods. We have prevention. We will be discussing cultural methods. Biological, not so much, because we don't have too many uh, biological methods available these days. Mechanical, and we'll be discussing a little bit of herbicide as well. So preventive methods. The first methods for preventing weeds to, uh, to come in your garden is preventing the production of seeds. So the first thing that you have to do is really, you know, um, preventing introducing introduce, uh, weeds from going to, preventing introduce weeds from going to seed. Uh, so it's basically taking care of any weeds that you have in, you know, in, in an environment by preventing the production of the seeds. So it can be through, uh, you know, pulling out the weed. It can be through mowing the weeds, uh, preventing the seed production because I mean the seed, based on what I told you before, the seed can last for a long period of time in the soil. Any seed that you can prevent to get back to the soil seed bank will be, uh, uh, you know, you will have to deal with less weed in the future. So really, that's the first prevention step is really preventing the production of seeds. Uh, if you're using some equipment, uh, try to clean the equipment. I've seen, you know, people using mowers. If they're cutting a lot of dandelions, there will be a lot of seed standing on the mowers. And if you're getting to a new area where you don't have a lot of dandelions, you want to make sure that you're doing a good job at cleaning your equipment because you will be introducing seeds. It's, it's true for, you know, home garden. It's true for field production as well. I mean, when people are harvesting uh, wheat, or uh, corn, or soybean, they want to make sure that they're doing a good job at eliminating everything in their big combine because if you have a problem with a weed, you don't want to get to introduce this plant to a new field, okay? Uh, if you're ir using irrigation, I mean, I'm always uh, telling people to make sure that they are using filters for making sure that they are not introducing a, a seed with irrigation. Um, if you're using mulch, manure, make sure that you have some things that have been thoroughly composted. Yeah, yeah Meredith? I just to you too, so it's, it, it is relevant to you. Yeah, it's... it's it, I, I, that's a good point. I was not thinking to that, but if you're collecting, uh, you know, from the rain, uh, you have so many species that will be dispersing through wind dispersion. On um, wind dispersion, I have a colleague of mine in Delaware. He went to a plane. He did a crazy study. He went to a plane, fly at high altitude, and try to collect seeds at different altitudes. He managed to find seed from this plant, from the horse reed, up to 6,000 feet altitude. Okay, so it can go very <laughs> high in altitude. So on your roof, if you're collecting the water which is, you know, coming from your roof, you will get seeds, no way. So make sure that, yeah, you're, you're focusing on that as well. Uh, something, it's a big source of introduction is when you're using mulch, if the mulch has not been uh, thoroughly composted, if you didn't get the increase in temperature, if, I mean, if it's not has been, I would say not sterilized, but if you, you know, you need to reach a certain temperature threshold for making sure that the seeds are sterilized. If you're not getting a good mulch, that may be a perfect way for introducing new weeds in your garden. Okay, that's some of the prevention method. Mechanical weed control, 
the first one, they're not classified, but the first one, and even in commercial farming, I mean, we still have to unremove some of the weed species, okay? And I will explain you why uh, later. So mowing, hoeing, uh, cultivation, mulches, landscape fabrics, we'll, we'll uh, look through that. So mowing, uh, that was a perfect illustration of, you know, the difference between a clean mower and a dirty one. Look at the accumulation of seed on this one, okay? So uh, why mowing is really uh, working great on, on plants that are, you know, uh, that are relatively tall, because when you do that by mowing, you're reducing the, domino, the, dom, um, the uh, dominance of uh, apico, uh, the apical dominance. Sorry. So basically, the plant is growing this way. This part of the plant, the apex, is driving the growth of the plant. If you're cutting the plant, what will happen is that you will have some uh, lateral bud that will start, you know, to produce flowers and, and blah blah blah. If you're doing that over time, keep mowing over time the plant will have to use a lot of nutrients to regenerate the stem and to, you know, to restore the, domic, the, the, the apical dominance even on lateral buds. If you do that over time, what will happen is that you will just exhaust the reserves that the plant has in the rhizome, in the roots, in the tape roots. So after a while, the plant will just die by, by mowing. But you have to do it on a regular basis to make sure that it's effective. Cultivation, um, so that's what we're uh, we're, we're, doing, uh, we're doing a lot of cultivation in veggies. Uh, it can control most of the weed species. It's relatively quick. It's easy to do. It's just mechanical equipment. Uh, disadvantage, it's expensive because you have to do it so often. I mean, because you don't, you know, when weeds are germinating, you just don't have one period of the year when they will be germinating. You can have several flush of germination in, during the season, like what we got this year. You know, it's shown that we had some rain, some good condition. We had a new flush of germination. So you have to come back regularly to make sure that you're doing a good job at, at, uh, at controlling with this kind of equipment. Uh, the weather can delay your operation. If you don't have the right condition to go into the field, you may not be able to use your, uh, your equipment. Uh, if it's too late, you will not get any good control. And one of the problems with this thing is that uh, you have the crop. So you need to make sure that you have good separation between uh, mechanically controlling the weeds, seedlings, without damaging the crops. And it's really tricky to do. And depending on the type of equipment, it's not so easy. So you may end up with, by getting some damage to the crop as well. One technique that in, in organic farming that we, uh, we are advising <coughs> growers to do is really using fold seed bed. So basically, what we are doing is that we are doing a seedbed preparation with a very light tillage of the soil. You don't want to go too deep. You don't want to go deeper than five inches of soil. What it will do is that when you're mixing, when you have this kind of abrasive you know, mixing of the soil, that will, that will stimulate the germination of the weeds. And what you can do is that when you get a first flush of germination, you can come back with a second shallow cultivation the second cultivation will mechanically destroy what has emerged, and then you can drill and plant your crop later. So that's the technique uh, for full seed bed. So it's basically stimulating the development of the weed first, killing them before planting, uh, uh, before planting your crop. And that's something that as home gardeners in your garden, that's something that you can do uh, relatively easily. Plastic or fabric mulch. Uh, Basically, this one, I mean, most of the time we are using black plastic mulch, especially in veggies, because it prevents light penetration. And light is one of the factors that is important in the germination of some, uh, some seeds. Uh, you know, the seeds that are really at the surface of the soil are a little bit, you know, one inch deeper in the soil. You will still have a little bit of light penetration, and it's really important for stimulating the germination of some uh, seed species. So if you're blocking the light, basically you will be blocking the germination of the weeds. But uh, it's not working all the time. I mean, it's, you've seen this one with the yellow nut sedge. Right here, the seed, it's amazing. I mean, you just have the punch hole where you're planting the crop. That's where the weed will start to grow. I mean, it's, <laughs> um, you may have good control over time, but I mean, this one will be particularly noxious because they will be next to the crop. Okay? They will be uh, competing directly uh, with the crop because, I mean, this one are directly uh, connected to the root system of the crop because they are just standing next to the crop. Soilization. Uh, Whoa! <laughs> I didn't mean that. 
<laughs> so solarization, uh, this time you're using a clear plastic mulch because you want to get light penetrating in the soil. So what's going, I mean, it's not really something, I mean, I, I don't know if we could do it in New Jersey, but if you're looking to California, uh, Israel, that's a technique that they will do easily over there because you have the nice condition to do it. So you're basically allowing the light to penetrate, uh, to increase the soil temperature, and you're creating basically a, a pattern of uh, sterilization of the soil and killing, killing the seeds, the weed seed. And just to finish with this one, that's a good illustration. When I was mentioning that in, in compost, in manure, you want to make sure you have done a good job by sterilizing the seeds, that's exactly what's going on here. So if you're increasing the soil temperature, you really uh, will have some sterilization of the seeds. So that's what we're looking in, uh, in compost on manure. Organic mulch, uh, that's some of my blueberry field. I took the picture yesterday. So you can see that we are using some uh, bark, some pine bark mulch on, on, on this one. It's really doing a great job at you know, uh, keeping away most of the weed species, but some weed species, especially um, this one, which are, so someone said it, I mean, yeah, it's a solidago, it's uh, oh, Canada, um, Goldenrod, Goldenrod, thank you. <laughs> so Goldenrod, I mean, it's really a problem. We don't have good control of Goldenrod with this one. So, you know, uh, I, I would say that each method will have advantage, but you will get inconvenient as well. On, on this one, one of the biggest inconvenience is that some species, they really don't care about, you know, the, the mulch. And if you're looking at yellow nut sedge, that will be another one. Yellow nut sedge can grow in whatever kind of environment. I've seen it on campus growing on concrete. There's nothing except concrete, and you have yellow nut sedge getting through. So yellow nut sedge will not be controlled with that at all. Biological methods. So biological method, uh, there is not much work that has been done. And someone was telling me the other day, yeah, I mean, uh, in the biological methods, you can you can include, you know, chickens, you can include sheep, you can include everything which is specifically targeting some plants. Uh, in my mind, I was more thinking of, you know, um, virus or fungi specifically developed for controlling a specific species, which is not really the case these days, or specific insects. Uh, we don't have really option available uh, for weed control uh, with this type of solution. But the few that are uh, present, I mean, uh, it's really target specific. It's environmentally friendly. Uh, usually you can get long-term control with this kind of methods. It's very site specific, meaning that it may be if you're working with a fungi, if you're working with a, a virus, it may be working in one place, but uh, you know, uh, 100 feet away, it may not be working at all. So that will be depending on, on, on a bunch of environmental condition. Handling may be difficult, it may be costly, and usually it will take a number of years before building up a population that can really uh, target the weed species. So at this point, that's not something which is really uh, um, available uh, for, for us. It may be available for nurseries, for some specific veggies production, but I would say for the home gardeners, for for, for big farm growers. Sure. The ones that I really like, because I did some work and I will present you that today, it's really cover crop. So basically cover crop, uh, you're planting something and you will use the residues at the surface of the soil for creating a mat. So instead of getting a plastic mat, you will get a mat of biomass that will prevent the germination of the weeds. So it's basically shucking out the weed before planting the crop of interest. So you need to, uh, to have a cover crop, you need to kill it, you need to roll it in a certain direction to make sure it's efficient. Uh, so the goal is really to, uh, when you're using cover crops, the goal is to maximize uh, cover crop biomass because the more biomass you have, the more residue you will get back to the soil surface and the more efficient will be your cover crop for uh, weed control. Uh, you need to choose the right cover crop um, depending on your region, on the climate. Uh, so usually in warm season, you can include bee, soybean, buckwheat, cowpea, millets, clover. Uh, winter cover crop will include rye, winter wheat. Are you doing cover crops in your garden? You need to use an optimum seeding rate. So that is, I mean, you can find information. I will not develop it today, but there is information available for you know, helping you to choose the right cover crop on you know, defining what is really good. Uh, just an illustration of uh, back to North Carolina, back to cotton. 
you have no cover crop on this side. You can see all the pigweed germinating between cotton rows. You have a cover crop on this side. You have nice clean cotton rows and you just have one small pigweed right here. Okay, that's the advantage of cover crop. Um, just to be a little bit more scientific on this one, so uh, I started with Jurek Mann, uh, who is another professor at Rutgers University, a, a trial in 2016 uh, at the Snyder Farm. We tested two different types of cover crop. We tested sun hemp, which is a nitrogen fixer crop. We use sudan grass, which is a, a kind of sorghum, so a very a, a poaceae, so a grass family. On uh, the next year, so we have cover crop for one year. On the next year, we planted cabbage. So we are looking at dynamic of soil nutrients. That was what my colleague Drake Mann was doing. And we are looking at weed density on biomass. So that's an hemp, uh, the nitrogen fixer cover crop. Um, really nice plant, nice showy flowers. That's the Sudan grass, typical sorghum. That's my technician, Bailika. Uh, she was collecting all the weeds. So we are planting frame in the soil and we are counting all the weed species that we have in this 18 by 18, 18 inches frame. So that just to give you an idea of what we observed this year. Um, you have the density of different weed for two different cover crops. You have Sudan grass, you have sun hemp. So that's the weed density. There is a significant reduction in the weed density when you're planting Sudan grass. Okay. If you're planting uh, Sudan grass, you will also see a nice reduction of weed biomass uh, with Sudan grass. So we had 90% reduction with Sudan grass on weed density and 45% reduction in weed biomass with Sudan grass. At this point, I don't know exactly what's going on. It may be, it may be allelopathy. It may be the fact that uh, nutrient may be less available with Sudan grass. Uh, it may be that with Sudan grass, we may have more leftover residues at the surface of the soil that will you know, really impede the development of the weeds. So that's just a visual to give you an idea of what, what we observed. So one part of the plot, we planted, uh, we planted the, the cabbage. The rest of the plot, we just let the weed go uh, to, to investigate what was going on. And right here, you have the sun grass on this side. On the left side, you have the sun hemp on this side. You can really see the difference of weed density on this one. Visually, it's really nice to see that. Uh, Two species that were really impacted with the sudan grass. I told you about Erigelin soga. It's a very important weed problem in, for veggies. We had 81% one year later, one year after the cover crop, we still have 80% reduction in, in uh, Gelin soga density and 70% reduction in uh, Gelin soga biomass. Pigweed, same thing, big reduction with sudan grass as compared to sun hemp. Okay? At this point, we did not see any effect of sudan grass. You may be thinking, well, yeah, you have a nice study. You're showing that you're impacting the weeds, but what is the effect on cabbage? I mean, for the two, I mean, I will harvest that uh, next week, but last year we did not observe any negative impact on, on cabbage. So that was really interesting to see that cabbage was not affected uh, as much as weed species. This one, this one, we mow it and we tilled it. So we mow it and we tilled it. So it, it can, it will depend on, you know, it's more equipment, it's more time for a grower to mow and till it than just use glyphosate. So the point of using glyphosate is just cost efficient. It's more cost efficient to use glyphosate than to terminate a cover crop with mowing on tillage. And that's, in, in this one, it's, it's an organic, you know, it, we're really uh, using it as an organic system. So we wanted to really keep everything organic. But for a professional grower, it, it will be yeah, more efficient, more cost efficient to, 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 uh, to buy glyphosate. Just finish it with one spray instead of maybe coming first time for mowing, coming a second time for, for tilling it. And you don't have any recurrence in the field after you till of your cover crop impacting your crop? Nope. Yeah. Nope. And in any case, you need to till for planting the cover crop too, for planting the crop, sorry. But I mean, what I wanted to mention is that it's working on some species. It doesn't seem to work on all species. Large crop grass right here, we don't see any significant difference. You may see a reduction, but if I'm running the statistics, that's not statistically different. Dandelion, which is a perennial crop, you don't see any reduction in dandelion. So it would be species. That's what I was mentioning before. You know, it's. You, you have different methods for controlling the weeds, but it may be 
species specific, basically. Last one that I wanted to mention, chemical, um, because you still have, as home gardeners, if you're going to Lowe's, you can still buy herbicide. <laughs> I mean, in Europe, not anymore. <laughs> in France, we have banned glyphosate uh, this year, and I mean, it's, uh, you cannot buy it anymore. Don't. Uh, so, you know what is an herbicide, chemical that is used to control, suppress, or kill weeds by interrupting the normal plant growth process. Uh, advantage, that was what I was mentioning before, inexpensive compared to other, you know, cultural or mechanical control, it's relatively inexpensive to buy herbicide. It's usually effective, it's fast acting, so growers like to see an immediate result. They don't, they don't like to wait for a few weeks or a few months before starting to see results. They want, they, they really like to see something immediate. Uh, and it can provide, depending on the species, it can provide long-term control. Disadvantage, you need to get some specific equipment. You can always get some injuries to your crop. Uh, the spray may drift. You can spray some uh, soybean. And if the next crop is tomatoes, if you have the right condition, you may have drift from what you spread in your soybean to the tomatoes. The tomatoes are very sensitive. They are not GMO. They are not modified to tolerate herbicide. You may get a lot of damage. Um, storage and disposal, it's always a problem because you have a lot of regulation for that. Um, obviously, the label must be read. On the label, maybe 40 pages. OK, this one, you have a nice soybean field. You have one plant right here. Do you want to pull it or leave it? Pull it, yeah. It's, it's a pigweed. It's, a, it's actually Palmer amaranth. Yeah, but there is another reason why you want to pull it. Have you heard of, of that herbicide resistance? So over time, when you are using herbicide over and over again, especially uh, glyphosate, uh, but some other herbicide as well, by doing that, we, the herbicide is not modifying the genome of the plant. Okay? The herbicide is killing the plants that are sensitive to this herbicide. And in the nature, in a million plants, you can have one which is naturally resistant to the herbicide because it may have a different uh, you know, uh, fittings, I mean, enzyme can be a little bit different. I mean, you have a switch in, in the amino acid sequence. This plant, the herbicide, will not be working on this plant specifically. If you're using herbicide over and over again, what will happen is that you will kill most of the sensitive plant, but the ones that are naturally resistant will survive. And over time, you will have production of seed for this one, and they will take the space, basically, that have been less that have been let uh, free by, by the sensitive plants. So these days in New Jersey, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six species of uh, weeds that are herbicide to, uh, that are resistant to some type of herbicide. We have this one, common ragweed. Uh, we know in some situation that it's resistant to at least not three herbicide, but three site of action. So herbicide are classified by site of action. They are targeting a specific biological pathway in the plant, okay? And when, uh, when you have one herbicide which, for which uh, we detected resistance, usually all the herbicides belonging to the same chemical family will not be efficient at controlling the plant anymore. So that's what we have right here with multiple resistance. We have resistance to three different modes of action, including, including this one, which is glyphosate. So common ragweed, uh, we have confirmed resistance to glyphosate in New Jersey. Maristel, we have confirmed resistance to glyphosate. Palmer amaranth, it's coming from the south. It's, uh, this day in the United States, it's resistant up to six modes of action. So it's, it's, it's crazy. And just to give you an illustration of what is herbicide resistance, right here you have untreated. So this plant has not been treated with glyphosate. This plant has been treated with the label rate of glyphosate, and it was uh, 20 days ago. So you can see that we just killed the top of the plant, but the plant is still green. Okay. This one has been killed with twice the label rate, and the, 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 rate, the label is allowed. So I can do it because I'm a scientist, <laughs> and I want to show you what it is 
ready to herbicide resistance, but a grower would not do that because it's twice much as what the law authorizes you to put uh, on, on this plant. So this one, you can see, yeah, it has been badly hurt, but you can see it's starting to grow back. Okay. Um, that's what you're getting when you're spraying 10 times the labor rate. Okay. You, so this one is skilled. But I, I was thinking, you know, it's, you may, you may be able to, to hear, you know, um, in the news um, about herbicide resistance. It's actually, there is a lot of discussion about that. And I just wanted you to get some kind of exposure and really see what is herbicide resistance. And it's a population of Maristade or Swedes that I collected uh, at the Maruchi Center. So it's Maruchi Center, you are right in the middle of the Pine Barren. Uh, in the Pine Barren, we are growing mostly cranberries. Uh, we don't deal with this one in, uh, it's not a problem in cranberries. So it just means that this plant, the maristate, the seed can travel so far away that we got seed on pollen, mostly pollen, that have been crossing with our, nut, with our population in, in the pine barrens and we started to get resistance as well. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> use common sense and good judgment when you're dealing with weed. <laughs> That was in North Carolina. <laughs> the, tra the tractor is really stuck into the ground. Okay. Any question? <laughs> um, uh, You're welcome.